We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. The International Court of Justice, which heard the oral arguments and the written arguments by South Africa, making the case that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza, has announced that they will make their decision on Friday, January 26th. Welcome to this week's episode of The Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today we're talking with Vijay Prashad. He is the executive director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. He's the chief editor of Leftward Books. He's a prolific author and most recently publishing a new book with Noam Chomsky called The Withdrawal, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, and the Fragility of U.S. Power. Vijay Prashad, welcome back. Thanks a lot, Brian. It's great to be with you as usual. Thank you so much. Uh, right before we started our program today, the announcement came that the ICJ will rule on Friday, uh, the ICJ is the primary judicial branch of the United Nations. Uh, the South Africans made a dramatic uh, case, an 84-page brief documenting that the Israelis have the intent to commit genocide using the statements of Israeli officials, civilian and military, the intent to commit genocide, and the methods and the application of military force such that they are indeed committing genocide. First of all, uh, let's talk about the importance of this application to the ICJ by South Africa. And what do we expect and what's the process if the ICJ um, moves to uh, adhere to or give uh, South Africa relief in its primary uh, demand, which is for an immediate end to the fighting in Gaza? Brian, it's really important to start by clarifying for people that there are two important international courts that are quite close to each other in that part of the low countries of Europe. One is the International Criminal Court, which was set up based on the Rome Statute. Now, the International Criminal Court is designed to go after individuals. The special prosecutor of that court is given a latitude, authority, to indict individuals and to hold individuals to account for what are considered crimes against humanity, genocide, and so on. That's the International Criminal Court. Um, the South Africans took their case to the International Court of Justice, a much older court, developed in 1948. It's a court with, which has 15 justices appointed by the UN Security Council. The difference between the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice is the, the Court of Justice is a court where countries, member states of the United Nations, can make a dispute uh, before judges uh, against another state. This is an interstate court, not a court where a prosecutor can indict individuals. It's very rare to see a country of the global south uh, come in to the International Court of Justice with such a powerful case against another member state of the UN which has been fully backed by the West. We really haven't seen this kind of thing happen before. Imagine a previous instance was the case against Myanmar. But, you know, Myanmar is not a country backed by a Western government. It, in fact, uh, it, its, its activities against the Rohingya uh, were very much maligned in the West as well, and correctly so. Uh, appalling treatment of the Rohingya people. But at that time, the West was in support of the dispute in the International Court of Justice. This is one of the first cases, to my mind, where a global South country, backed by other global South countries, uh, and not only are they global South countries, but South Africa is not a Muslim majority state. So you can't say that this has got to do with something narrowly about you know, Islam or, or, or that this has got to do with solidarity with Muslims in, in, in Gaza. No, no, this is a political case. The South Africans have a history from 1948 to 1994 of living under direct apartheid. 
they understand what apartheid is they have been concerned for a long time the last 30 years since they ended apartheid they've been concerned about the situation of the palestinians under israeli rule in the occupied palestinian territory as well as inside 1948 israel so the fact that south africa brought this case to the international court of justice the fact that it was backed by a range of countries including countries in latin america uh, is something i think notable the 15 judge panel plus judges one judge from israel one judge from south africa have been reviewing as you said this remarkable 84 page document which documents uh, the claim of genocide israel was not really able to answer that claim on friday when the judges come back and make their 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 comments uh, on this uh, it is hoped that they will advance provisional measures that's the term of art here provisional measures uh, and those provisional measures which the south africans have asked for uh, include as you said an an immediate ceasefire now it's important for people to recognize that this court decision is 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 binding it's not um, a decision which can be appealed this is it if they say provisional measures the fighting must end israel must stop the bombardment israel must stop the bombardment the question rises brian who is going to enforce uh, this judicial decision and therefore the um, hearings document will go to the un security council and it is up it is incumbent upon the un security council to enforce this this ruling now this is going to put a lot of pressure brian on the us government the united states won't have the space to veto anything it's not a un security council resolution this is a binding ruling coming from the international court of justice asking the security council and the united nations to enforce the provisional measures this is not uh, asking them to frame a resolution there is no room for a veto how will israel react to this will they stop the fighting how will the united states react to this will they allow the enforcement uh, of the ruling if indeed the ruling says on friday um, that the israeli bombardment must, must cease these are open questions which we will have to uh, return to perhaps next week when it's clearer how they react what firstly what the ruling is and then how israel and in particular the united states react to it right so benjamin netanyahu the prime minister of israel had said regardless of what happens at the hague meaning at the international court of justice this war is going to continue we're going to go forward and you know uh, vj in the last couple of days there was a big announcement big news in israel that 21 or 22 israeli soldiers had been killed all at once and that was considered like a major news story uh, evoking lots of conflicting emotions inside of the israeli body politic Uh, again we have 25,000 Palestinians have been killed uh since October 27th and it's probably a lot more than that and 90% of the population has been or maybe it's 85% have been displaced they can't live in their homes because their homes have been bombed and destroyed or badly damaged so they're they're running they're fleeing but in fact there's nowhere to hide uh those soldiers were killed because they were preparing to demolish buildings they were putting explosives around the building and some uh palestinian fighter hit a nearby tank apparently with a, a rocket propelled grenade and so all of the explosives blew up while they were still there but when you think about the israeli military going through and blowing up buildings and saying oh this is in self defense i mean how is that not genocide and how is that not a war crime as defined by the genocide convention and other international law that speaks to war crimes well firstly i think mr netanyahu's statement that they will continue to prosecute their genocidal war regardless of the international court of justice ruling is an indication that the israelis are preparing for the international court of justice to offer provisional measures and demand a ceasefire i think that itself is an indication but now it's important to recognize what's happening in israel within israel brian i mean i think um, 
within Israel, polls are showing that Israelis don't want to know what's happening in Gaza. They simply don't want to know. There is a recognition that this bombardment has been horrific, genocidal, and so on. Gadi Eisenkot, former head of the Israeli Defense Force, leader now of the opposition in Israel, a member of Netanyahu's war cabinet, told an Israeli channel, Channel 12, last week that um, Mr. Netanyahu has lost the trust of the Israeli people and that Israel must go to elections. I found this very interesting that Mr. Eisenkot made this statement uh, right now at this point. Netanyahu is having a hard time balancing his coalition. Uh, there is now for the first time internal dissent in Israel around this war. Um, I, I just want to say something parenthetical that it was a little disappointing to me uh, to hear the Saudi foreign minister at Davos at a time when Israel is, in a sense, on the fence on these issues, under pressure from the International Court of Justice. The Israeli military has decided that they are now going to phase three. Uh, you know, this is an important, um, you know, uh, uh, admission by the Israeli military that they're not able to advance their goals. Phase three, by the way, means that they're going to pull out many of the troops from Gaza and just go in on raiding missions. I think the death of these 21 soldiers has rattled the Israeli Defense Force. They are moving now to phase three. At this time, when Israel is being quite weakened on the international stage, unable to actually prosecute its war aims beyond mass destruction in Gaza, um, they have had to withdraw their troops and so on. At this time, Saudi foreign minister makes a declaration at Davos, at the World Economic Forum, saying, listen, um, we are willing to normalize with Israel if they conduct an immediate ceasefire. I mean, to offer that on the table right now strikes me as extraordinarily revealing of the shallowness of the Saudis when it comes to their support for the Palestinians. The fact that he can make a comment like this in the context when it looks like the pressure on Israel to conduct a ceasefire is going to be enormous. And when there might be pressure as well, Brian, to prevent what the Israeli high officials have been calling the Gaza Nakba or the second Nakba, meaning the erasure of a Palestinian presence in Gaza. At that time for the Saudis to make this comment, I thought was extremely um, unhelpful for the cause of Palestinian justice. Um, whatever the International Criminal Court rules, however they rule, most likely they will rule for provisional measures. Um, it is extraordinary how the South Africans have lifted the cudgel. And I want to recognize this because I, I see this very much as part of a new mood in the global South. Um, the South Africans not only took this to the court, but then the government of Germany, you know, which has its, as you know, its own history of genocide within Europe, the mass killing of Jews, uh, you know, Romani people and others within Europe. The Germans then made a public statement saying, no, no, we back Israel. There is no genocide happening in Gaza. And, you know, at that point, somebody that I've known for a while, Mr. Hage Gienbob, the president of Namibia, released a very powerful statement. And I think people need to recognize that, you know, Namibia is not a very strong uh, country on world affairs. It's faced its own challenges since uh, the South West Africa won its independence, became Namibia. It's faced a lot of challenges. The president of Namibia, Mr. Gaingob, released a statement directly speaking to the Germans saying, listen, um, we don't accept your statement about Israel and what's happening in Gaza. And we don't accept it because we don't think you have legitimacy when it comes to talking about genocide. And instead of talking about the Holocaust, which they very well could have, they reminded the world that between 1904 and 1908, the Germans conducted a genocide against the Herero and Namikwa people in then Southwest Africa, now Namibia. And reminding the world of that genocide, he said, you know, countries like Germany should not enter um, a deliberation when it comes to things like genocide. We know better. And I think this is a very interesting development in world affairs where the South is saying we have more legitimacy when it comes to adjudicating issues such as genocide, mass killing and crimes against humanity, because 
We are its victims. Yeah, so important. Uh, I'm so glad you mentioned Namibia, VJ. And of course, Namibia, or what was then Southwest Africa, uh, became a German colony as a consequence of an agreement uh, in Berlin in 1884, where all the colonizers, the imperialists, the major capitalist powers of Western Europe and the U.S. was there as an observer, they decided to divide Africa. And they divided Africa, and within 18 years, all African self-governance, with the exception of Ethiopia, vanished. In 18 years. I mean, the complete colonization of Africa, and it included a lot of massacres, a lot of destruction of peoples by all kinds of measures. And, you know, when you think about Palestine and you think about all of the countries of the Middle East, they were also part of that. They were part of the colonial division, uh, at first a peaceful division before 1914, and then a violent division or redivision after the start of World War I. But these are, this is, I'm so glad you framed it that way, VJ, because there's a reason Palestine has the support of the people in Namibia and South Africa and all the uh, countries and peoples of the global south because they are the colonized people. And this isn't a struggle that began in, 18, uh, in, 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 20, in October 7th, and it's not really a, even started in 1948 with the Nakba. It is the history of colonialism as perhaps the dominating issue for the majority of the people on the planet. Uh, and again, the U.S. has always used proxy forces like the Saudi royal family and others in the global south. Uh, there are tensions, yes, but they rule by you know a number of different means, but including using proxy or comprador bourgeoisie in the global south, in the colonized or semi-colonized parts of the world. But this is an epic battle. And you know when you think about what's changed in the world, the Palestinians have said, we will not disappear. We will not be erased by this colonial process. You know, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu was at the United Nations two weeks before October 7th. And I want to, we have some B-roll of it. It's a, him showing a map. And it includes Saudi Arabia. That's one of the reasons I think it's important to notice, because there's Netanyahu showing, look, we now have peace with all of these different Arab countries. We have peace with Egypt. We're going to have peace with Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia was on the verge of normalizing and creating a diplomatic relationship, normal relations with the state of Israel. Uh, and if you look at that map closely, VJ, there is no Gaza. There is no West Bank. It's a complete erasure of the Palestinian people. This was two weeks before October 7th. This colonial project where the indigenous people, the indigenous inhabitants, the people who have lived there for thousands of years are being erased because it's in the interest of colonial powers. And what happened on October 7th is the Palestinians said, no, you're not going to erase us. Uh, we're here. And if you look at the, what's going on in the past four months, the South African case, the global protest movement, the statements of countries like Namibia, uh, it's, it's brought Palestine back to the fore. So, you know, what are the Palestinians supposed to do? Be erased, silently, quietly, go down, just be, you know, have either a cultural genocide or a complete diaspora or an actual physical genocide without struggle? Or will they and should they struggle? And Palestine has made it clear, using all kinds of methods, that they won't be erased. They're going to keep fighting. Yeah, I mean, look, frankly, um, Mr. Netanyahu and other high officials uh, have said for a very long time that um, there is no such thing as Palestine. You know, th this, this uh, refusal to accept the existence of a Palestinian state project, in other words, to accept um, the Oslo Accords as something that uh, must be rooted in Israeli politics. You know, ever since 1994, when the Oslo Accords were on the table, the Israelis have violated them. They've never taken it seriously. You know, uh, Brian, I came on your show and we talked about that slogan, from the river to the sea. Um, and people are very upset about it. And they think, well, this means that 
um, those who use the slogan are talking about the erasure of Israel. Well, interestingly enough, this slogan is right there in the maps and statements made by high Israeli officials, but they see from the river to the sea as part of Eratz Israel, greater Israel. There's no need to have the Palestinians anywhere. In fact, when people in the Palestinian movement say from the river to the sea, what they are often referring to, and not always, I'll grant you that there are people who have ideas I don't agree with, but they are often talking about the founding of a state project, which is neither a Jewish state nor a Palestinian state, but a democratic republic of all peoples who live in that territory. I think most people are of that view, what is sometimes in shorthand called a one-state solution. I mean, genuinely, uh, a genuine, sincere look at the statements made by Mr. Netanyahu, just Mr. Netanyahu, in his long career in Israeli politics will show you that he has never regarded uh, it, uh, it, it as an available possibility to have a Palestinian state. Uh, the erasure of Gaza is something has been on the map for a long time. The Israeli state project has already incorporated large parts of East Jerusalem. It's difficult to find in East Jerusalem even the old cemeteries. Um, some of the old cemeteries have been bulldozed and made into parking lots. Uh, the famous cemetery that has the Khalidi family graves uh, was basically erased and made into a parking lot. The West Bank, I mean, people are aware al already of the illegal settlement project and so on. The two-state solution is something the Israeli government has never accepted. And so now for Mr. Netanyahu to say once again, we reject the two-state solution, should provoke surprise. This is precisely the logic of um, the Likud party, certainly um, Mr. Netanyahu's right-wing partners, but I think also part of the Israeli state project. Because a lot of this stuff is financed by the Israeli state, including um, the the Labour Party also is, is participating in this. So, I mean, I feel like if people are surprised by some of this stuff, they shouldn't be. And those who are upset about the slogan from the river to the sea, you should be upset about the annexationist mentality that is there in, among Israeli high officials documented in the 84 page. Um, the statement made before the International Court of Justice. Just go and read those pages uh, that are available at the International Court of Justice website, and you will see statement after statement essentially saying that the Palestinians have to be removed. That is a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention under the, um, the, the idea of population transfer. It's a war crime. Uh, you will see use of language like human animals, savages and so on, dehumanizing language used by not fringe right-wing elements. You know, Brian, we are used to fringe right-wing elements using this sort of language. These are high officials of the government, including the president of Israel, Isaac Herzog. Isaac Herzog was photographed signing his name to bombs that were used to drop on residential areas in Gaza. Mr. Herzog was then welcomed at the World Economic Forum as a legitimate um, you know, world leader. Mr. Herzog should soon be too scared to travel. Why? Because they should be using universal jurisdiction, a warrant for his arrest uh, for war crimes against the Palestinians. If the ICJ provisional measures comes out, I am sure there will be a lot of pressure, Brian, on the International Criminal Court to file individual warrants against people like Isaac Herzog. And I am sure a judge, somebody like Bartholomew Garzon in Spain, is going to use universal jurisdiction to file um, a some sort of you know, Interpol warrant for the arrest of people like Isaac Herzog, Benjamin Netanyahu, and all the people, the high officials, who've been involved at least in this war against the Palestinians. Uh, there's precedent for that as well, VJ. Uh, you know, Pinochet, the military dictator in Chile, uh, thought he had impunity, but actually this same concept and principle was applied, and he was arrested while traveling. Donald Rumsfeld, after the Iraq War, had to restrict his travel because uh, courts in Europe were 
you know, eager to prosecute uh, American officials for war crimes against the people of Iraq. I mean, it's not actually a small thing. So when we look at what's going on, you see, uh, VJ, and this is what we talked about in our last show, that uh, there's an attempt to caricature, demonize, and, and, and sort of cast those advocating Palestinian liberation as advocates of genocide. And then River to the Sea has been demonized on college campuses and student groups are being shut down because they're chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. The Likud party, and Benjamin Netanyahu is the leader of the Likud party, they have that same slogan in their manifesto from 1977. Their intention was to take all of Palestine, as you, as you said. We're reaching this climax. I feel like we're reaching a climax. Netanyahu has been fully embraced by, by Biden. And I think Biden, we, we thought, or I certainly thought a, a month or two ago, that the U.S., because Israel was becoming so globally isolated, that the U.S. would sort of restrain Israel or tell them to stop. I thought that might happen and that a deal could be worked out, some sort of deal, either a long-term deal or an interim deal. But Netanyahu knows his political career is at stake. He can't, he, the prolongation of the war is actually in his interest. And I think the U.S. has come to the conclusion, and I want to get your thoughts on this, I think Biden has come to the conclusion that if Israel could actually win, if they could win, if they could be, even if all of Gaza is destroyed, if they could militarily free at least some of the hostages and kill the Hamas leadership, uh, then they will have some trophies and they can say, mission accomplished, as George W. Bush said when he got on that aircraft carrier after the fall of Baghdad in 2003. I think Biden is all in on the genocide because they think the only way that this can be justified from a political point of view, not a moral point of view, not an ethical point of view, because there is no justification, but from a narrow political point of view, is if the Israelis can win, so-called win, whatever that means, but they can only win with genocide. Anyway, I want to get your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think that the United States has to really introspect, at least the the leading officials of the United States, the ruling elites have to really introspect. I mean, when is the last time, Brian, the United States has actually won a war in terms of political objectives? Um, you know, you mentioned the book I did with, with Chomsky. Uh, it's called The Withdrawal for Good Reason. Um, the United States went into Afghanistan with the aim of eradicating the Taliban, um, making... Um, you know, Afghanistan safe from any kind of threat. Well, 20 years later, the United States was defeated by the Taliban. The United States had to leave. Didn't gain political objective there. Then the United States enters Iraq in 2003, an illegal war, not sanctioned by the United Nations, a war of aggression against the Iraqi people. Hence, the war crimes and questions of universal jurisdiction against George W. Bush, um, you know, against Donald Rumsfeld and so on. Um, well, then again, you know, almost a decade later, it didn't take 20 years, the United States discovered a little more than a decade later that, well, they had to leave. And in fact, they found that Iranian influence in Baghdad had increased, not U.S. influence. Um, and now uh, the United States sitting in northern Iraq, in fact, in a way, colonizing Kurdistan. There are also Israeli troop presence there in northern Iraq, um, you know. They are being called upon by the Iraqi government. And in fact, this statement reiterated at Davos um, by the Iraqi prime minister saying, well, you know, the U.S. must now remove troops from all Iraq territory. So much for attaining any war aims in Iraq. And then let's move on to Libya, 2011. United States with France uh, under the cover of NATO bombs that country, destroys the state, murders Muammar al-Gaddafi. And then leaves what? Chaos. There are at least two governments sitting in Libya. No real war aims uh, achieved because Libyan oil is now still offline for Europe. Uh, part of the reason why Europe is struggling uh, to survive, part of the reason why Europe became more energy dependent on Russia 
as it turned out. Um, the United States is a very poor judge of what victory is. And you already referenced George W. Bush's mission accomplished moment. Very poor judge of victory. In this case, you know, people need to reflect. If you're going to back the Israeli uh, position, Mr. Netanyahu's war cabinet, all the way to victory, victory means completion of the genocide. That's what victory means. I mean, you know, Hamas as an organization, the, the Islamic resistance movement, the acronym is Hamas. Hamas was only founded in 1987. Hamas was not there in 1948. The Hamas was not there during the uprising of 1936. Um, there has been a Palestinian resistance movement that long preceded Hamas, and there will be a Palestinian resistance movement that comes even if Hamas is, as it were, destroyed now. Um, because unless there is justice for the Palestinians, that resistance movement is going to continue. It will germinate somewhere. It's already restive in the camps in Jordan, restive in the camps in Lebanon. You're not going to be able to control this. Right now, 25, 26,000 Palestinians have been killed. Uh, that still leaves several million Palestinians in Gaza itself. Where will they go? You'll push them into the Sinai Desert, for instance. Egypt doesn't want that. Egypt is not interested in that because that is going to pressure Egypt to crack down on the Palestinians, a very bad look. Um, otherwise, they'll have to cut the peace deal they have with Israel. If there are Palestinians in Sinai that want to conduct operations against um, the Israelis, it's going to put Egypt. So Egypt doesn't want to be put in that position. There is no victory for Israel here. You know, I've tried to game out, Brian, all the different scenarios. You know, I've sat with my notebook saying, OK, this is if this happens, what happens? We're talking two million Palestinians, most of them uh, young people, uh, very angry, very upset. Uh, they are radicalized in a way that the Israelis will not be able to understand. I mean, I was at an interview with um, Khalid Mishal of Hamas in, 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 uh, in Doha, Qatar. Mr. Khalid Mishal made a very straightforward statement. This is about 12 years ago. Mr. Khalid Mishal said, you know, those people who demonize Hamas, they don't know what kinds of political views are germinating in the camps and small towns of Gaza. There are people far to the right of us, far more dangerous than us. That's Khalid Mishal, the leader of Hamas. What he was trying to indicate is that, in fact, uh, the frustrations among young people are taking them into directions that the Israelis pr probably know about and might even welcome, Brian, because that will increase their own uh, pretext for much more genocidal activity. I think people need to understand that there is no way for the Israelis to win unless they, quote unquote, complete the genocide. The Biden administration is, in fact, you know, shoulder deep in the blood of Palestinians in this in this war, cannot extricate itself in himself. Mr. Biden travels around the United States. Everywhere he goes, he gets heckled by people in the crowd, calling him genocide Joe, calling, you know, calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. I mean, if Mr. Biden even hopes to have a chance at re-election uh, against perhaps Donald Trump, he's going to and his team are going to reflect deeply on how their geopolitical strategy is going to bring down um, their possibility of re-election, I think already has, has brought curtains to it. Um, they have no exit strategy. Mr. Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, looks more and more haggard, Brian. Every time I see him on television, he looks more destroyed and devastated. I don't think he knows what's going on. Um, you know, the fact that the United States bombed Yemen repeatedly now, a second time, uh, in fact, a very large attack, 87 strikes. Um, this, the fact that the United States with Britain attacked Yemen shows their absolute cluelessness about what's happening in the region. They have no idea what they're doing. And as a situation like this unfolds and they have no idea, they go to what they know, which is attack, which is violence. Uh, they don't have any way of understanding the politics of what they're doing. Hence, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. And now, of course, um, they are entering this conflict in Yemen. 
And I, I would say to the people in the United States, you're making a big mistake. Do not enter this conflict once again. You already entered it on the backs of the Saudis, and the Saudis are desperately trying to find a way to get out of that conflict because in many ways they have been defeated. You, uh, Vijay, when President Obama announced the, the desire to pivot to Asia back in 2011, I think he represented a faction within the U.S. ruling class establishment that was thinking geostrategically, uh, let's not be bogged down in endless war in the Middle East because we keep fighting these losing battles. Middle East and South Asia, in the case of Afghanistan, we're, we're fighting these losing battles, and it's taking trillions of dollars and lots of life, and we're getting nothing out of it. There's no real, there's no colonial result that, you know, they're weakening the region, they're killing lots of people, but killing people doesn't really add up to a financial or political advantage to U.S. imperialism. And China was rising, quote, peacefully. It didn't have America on its back. Now, we know what the pivot to Asia means. We didn't know exactly what it meant in 2011. Some of us thought we knew what it meant, and maybe we were right. But it really meant turning the U.S. military and enormous economic and political pressure on China to, quote, contain China, slow down China's growth, because the U.S. views China's development as a losing, uh, a part of a losing equation, uh, a sort of a zero-sum game, because if China rises, the U.S. empire thinks it's at the diminution of America, and perhaps from the point of view of imperialism, not from the Amer point of view of the American people, maybe it does diminish the power of the empire. But here we are, Vijay, in 2024, you know, 13 years after the pivot to Asia, and the U.S. and its foreign policy establishment and the military bogged down again because this is Israel's war, but it's really America's war. I mean, Israel could not actually do what it's doing without America's full engagement. So you're talking about hubris, arrogance, geostrategic mistakes, lack of accountability, failed policies, but absent sort of punishment, absent somebody being held to account, the same players make the same mistakes over and over again. And again, it's human beings in the targeted countries that pay the real price. But from the point of view of U.S. empire, it's a losing battle too. I mean, it's a really, it's, it's, it really shows in a way how arrogance and hubris are really a vital enemy of the U.S. empire but lack of accountability by those who demonstrate arrogance and hubris and thus make one mistake after another, it doesn't stop. It says a lot, Brian, about also the information order in, in the West in general, not just in the United States. You know, I looked at polling data recently, and in the United States, majorities of people want a ceasefire in Gaza. Majorities of people think that the United States is spending too much money in Ukraine. Those are sane opinions. Um, the ruling elites and the government are not there with the public on these issues. You know, um, th this is Pew uh, type polling, you know, so it has some legitimacy. There are people saying we want to ceasefire, majorities of people, and saying we don't want to spend all this money. 44% of Democrats, in fact, saying that too much money is going to Ukraine, 67% um, of Republicans. So on these two issues, the people have developed, I don't know from what, perhaps the protests in New York City, which um, the mayor and others seem to be so bent out of shape about, those protests are having an impact. And the New York Post can't write enough articles to change people's minds because people are disheartened by what they're seeing in, in Gaza. On the other hand, Polling data also shows that a majority of people wouldn't mind the United States going to war with China. I find that very interesting. That why is that the case? And that's the failure, in a way, of the information order. Um, shouldn't there be 
some reporting in the New York Times, in the Washington Post saying, look, frankly, it's a bad idea for the United States to go to war with China. Why? China is a very large country, 1.4 billion people. Um, the Chinese have a very strong military to defend their borders. They have nuclear weapons. They have missiles. It's a very stupid idea. And they would also defend themselves. They are not willing to allow themselves you know, to be bombed and they'll take it silently. Um, I'm surprised in a way by the irrationalism of the high media elites in the United States that they are not even trying to enter into a discussion and debate with the general public saying, this is a terrible idea. China is not going to be like, um, you know, what you'd imagine, let's say, missile strikes against Sudan uh, when Bill Clinton launched them, you know, against Khartoum um, on the street where my, my uncle actually lived, uh, was struck by, by that missile in, in Khartoum in 1998. You know, China will retaliate. In fact, you want a measure of what might happen if you attack a Chinese city. Look at what the Yemenis are doing. I mean, Yemen, for instance, coming back to Yemen, Brian, Yemen um, attacked by Saudi Arabia in 2015. Why were they attacked by Saudi Arabia? Because a popular movement from the north of Yemen, bordering the uh, Saudi-Yemeni uh, border, uh, decided to lead a big march from their part of the country in Yemen to Sana'a, the capital. Now, these people who marched are mostly from the Houthi tribe. They are not Houthis, by the way. This is the Zaidi uh, Islam movement. They, are, they have a political movement called Ansar Allah. They are Zaidi Shias. Uh, people should know that the Zaidi Shias used to once rule Yemen um, around and, you know, they defeated the Ottomans just before the British colonial elite took over southern Yemen in 1839. Zaidi Shias have a very long history of being rulers in Yemen. Anyway, the Houthi tribe, they are Zaidi Shias, they marched to Sana'a and they led a big national movement against inflation, against the destruction of the country and overthrew a government, the Hadi government, which was sitting in a move and pick hotel. People may not know move and pick. Move and pick is a five-star hotel. They spent two years in this move and pick hotel trying to create some national reconciliation plan. Well, the Zaidi Shias led by this movement called Ansar Allah decided, forget it. We're not going to sit around in some hotel and for two years discuss this while people are starving. We're just going to march to Sana'a and they took over the government. Um, the Saudis did not like that, started a war. That war has been going since 2015 till today. Almost nine years that war has been going. Saudis mercilessly bombed the country, destroyed the infrastructure, destroyed uh, the port, attacked the roads, you know, made it very hard to survive. The Yemenis have survived. Not only have they survived, they fought back. They defeated Saudi Arabia. Now, when this uh, war, genocidal war took place, is taking place in Gaza, the, the Ansar Allah movement and the Yemeni government said, we are not going to allow particularly ships with Israeli flags, but any ship that is um, you know, providing supplies to Israel, not going to be allowed to get through our waters. And they started attacking them. United States says, we're going to bomb you. Let me ask the US planners a question from your show, Brian. Let me ask Lloyd Austin, have you studied what Ansar Allah and the Yemeni people went through against the Saudis. Do you think they are going to be deterred by half a dozen cruise missiles? Do you think they care? They have fortified themselves to battle against relentless Saudi bombardment. These things that they are doing, which are killing Yemeni civilians, by the way, are not going to impact what's happening in Yemen. They are going to keep fighting. If you want to understand what it's going to mean to go to war against China, study the Yemenis. The Yemenis are united to defend their country against any and every attack, including by the British. I mean, the British, disgraceful. Britain colonized Yemen from 1838 till 1962. It's a disgrace that they feel that they have the right to bomb Yemen again. It's disgraceful. Rishi Sunak should be ashamed of himself for that. The Yemenis aren't going to back down because of somebody has come and pricked them with a pin. They have faced much worse from the Saudis. And that's a good place for Lloyd Austin and others to study and for the editors of the New York Times to study what it might mean if the U.S. thinks it can go and attack China. The Chinese are not going to be subordinated. This is not 
Sudan, nineteen ninety-eight. They are going to fight back. They are going to defend their borders. Um, so, I mean, there needs to be when I use terms like hubris and so on, Brian. There needs to be some reflection in the United States in the upper reaches. Some sanity needs to be there, and I think we, as people who are interested in bringing some sort of sensitivity and rationality into the public discourse, uh, we are trying to play our role. But look. The moment we try to play our role, they malign us. You know, they say you are this, that, and the other thing. Look, let's have a conversation. Why do you feel the need to malign um, us rather than have a conversation with us? I mean, I thought these people are supposed to be democratically minded. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Yemen. If we had a, a, a image of the map of the Middle East where we could show Yemen, I would love to have it because Yemen, when you compare it to Gaza. Is very big, uh, and it's a huge area. And the and the struggle between the Yemeni people and the Saudis created a military infrastructure like Gaza, which, which is largely underground. I mean, the tunnel structure that the Israelis have so much trouble penetrating in Gaza. I mean, that's small compared to what the Yemeni resistance forces have developed over these last years. And you're right, VJ. I mean, U.S. Special Operation Forces were on the ground in Yemen, and they were giving the bombing coordinates to the Saudi military, to the Air Force, the Saudi Air Force, so that they could drop thousands of bombs and missiles on the people of Yemen, and they did not persevere. They did not win. So you had the U.S. I mean, this is the irony of the situation. George W. Bush bombed Yemen. Obama bombed Yemen. Trump bombed Yemen. Now Biden is bombing Yemen. And what's the consequence? What's the result? On American TV, people are talking about how Yemen is a terrorist entity. Like, really? I mean, if you drop thousands of bombs and support the bombing of a country by, in this case, Saudi Arabia, and you do that for that long, four consecutive presidents have been bombing Yemen. But Yemen is the terrorist. I mean, it shows the absurdity of the narrative. I mean, it's the same with Cuba. I mean, Cuba, which is a victim of American uh, terrorism, is on the terrorist list because Trump decided to end Obama's policy of semi-normalization by putting Cuba back on the terrorism list. And Biden continued Trump's policy rather than going back to Obama's policy. But my point is that the narrative about terrorism and who's to blame and who's responsible, it has an impact for a while on the American people because the mainstream media is this faithful echo chamber repeating all of this obvious nonsense as if because it's repetition and done over and over and over again, some part of the population will believe it must be true. The Yemenis must be terrorists because every TV station they turn on says they are. But then the people of the world who are not watching MSNBC or CNN, they look at this and they know completely, completely what the deal is. They know the deal. Anyway, I think that, as you're saying, Israel can't win, but U.S. imperialism, because there is no rationality, there is no reasonableness in this policy, military and foreign policy, it can't win either. But it can do a lot, a lot of damage. Um, I want to I want to talk a little. We have a, a clip about. I want to spend a moment or two on the narrative issue. There was a debate in the UN between the South African foreign minister and the Israeli ambassador about the beheading uh, by Hamas allegedly of babies in Israel. Now we all know that that turned out to be completely untrue. I want to play the clip and I want to talk to you though because if you talk, take a poll among large parts of the American people, they'll think, yeah, Hamas, terrorist, uh, they beheaded babies, it's all true. Anyway, this fight about narrative is so politically important. That's why the protests matter, that's why independent alternative media matters, that's why TriCon matters. Anyway, let's play this clip and then I wanna get your thoughts. Did I hear you correctly saying that the atrocities that we are speaking about, the beheading of children, that those are fake news, that it's not true. Is that the position of the South African government? I want to ask you now. Thank you. 
No, it is evidence that has been provided by a range of non-governmental organizations, both in Israel and Palestine, because we don't only speak to Palestinians, we speak to peace-loving Israelis as well. And we know that there's a lot of fake news that attempts to cast Palestinians in a bad light. And it has been admitted, even from the White House spokesperson, that that statement that was made at the highest level was actually proven not to be factual. So, Honorable Member, I've responded to your question. And it's important, as I said at the start of my contribution, that when we speak on these matters, let us speak being honest and factual. You know, the South Africans, BJ, they went to the ICJ, the UN highest judicial court. But there is this other court, the Court of World Public Opinion, which, as a socialist, as a Marxist, ultimately, if you believe that people make history, that the class struggle is the motor force, and, and by class struggle, I mean the struggle against imperialism, is a motor force for change. This other court, the Court of Public Opinion, is perhaps even more important than any other legal court. And the South Africans, when they have been making these arguments so well, so with such eloquence, and basing it on truth, they have garnered the support of the Global South. 61 countries, and all of them are in the Global South, none of them are NATO members, have signed on to support the South African claim. Yeah, I mean, firstly, um, the foreign minister of South Africa, Nalidi Pandor herself, is a person of great integrity. And the way she handles questions like that is really to be commended. Um, these are heroes of our time, you know, who are brave and willing to stand up. The fight over narrative, as you put it, is extremely important. And if I may, let's go back to the Yemen issue for a moment. Um, you know, the way in which people talk about what's happening in Yemen, um, the kind of callousness, uh, there's so much forgetting. What's forgotten, for instance, is that the United States government, in fact, um, through various forms of drone strike and airstrike, assassinated not only a number of Yemenis, lists are available, not only were there Yemeni teenagers sitting in Guantanamo, but the United States government, led at the time by Barack Obama, actually killed U.S. citizens in Yemen who they uh, said were terrorists. There was no due process for them. I'm talking about first Anwar al-Awlaki, who was a cleric uh, from the United States in Yemen. Um, you know, he himself was admitted that he was participating in violent activities, but there was no due process. He was killed. Okay. Now, one could say, well, he himself admitted and so on. But was there a need to kill 16-year-old Abdul Rahman al-Awlaki, his son, on a subsequent drone strike? A 16-year-old U.S. citizen was killed in Yemen. Was there any need for that? No accountability, by the way, for the murder of a 16-year-old U.S. citizen uh, in Yemen who had no connection to al-Qaeda or any group. No accountability. It's almost as if the narrative sees Yemen as a place for target practice. Even the use of the word Houthi, I think, is very objectionable, in my opinion. Uh, as I said before, the Al-Houthis are a tribe from the northern part of Yemen. The government in charge is led by a political party called Ansar Allah. To say, oh, they are the Houthis and the Houthis are terrorists is very much objectionable to me. Because the Houthis is a name of a of a tribe. It's a community name. Um, you can't, you know, they depoliticize what's happening in Yemen and make it some sort of a historical, um, you know, entity called the Houthis, which are somehow related to Iran and are um, and are therefore terrorists. Firstly, it's important for people, as I said, to understand that the Al Zaid uh, Sheikh that came to Yemen in the year eight hundred long precedes uh, even the arrival of Islam in Iran. Okay, They have a history that is their own history. They have built their own movements. They have built their own political formation called Ansar Allah. They are not proxies of Iran. To call Hezbollah, for instance, a proxy of Iran is to misunderstand 
the politics of southern Lebanon to misunderstand what the great um, the green mountains of Lebanon have produced. It's a long history. Again, predates um, you know even the formation of 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 of, of the Persian uh, empires uh, transfer into Islam, and certainly long predates the creation of the Islamic Republic in 1979. So this is all about the narrative, you know, the way loosely New York Times will say, well, you know, the Houthis in, in Yemen. Wait a minute. Do you mean to say that this tribal confederacy in the north of Yemen on the border of Saudi Arabia are all condemned to being terrorists? Therefore, open season, kill them all. Uh, there is a kind of laxity uh, of mind that suggests, for instance, the Houthis are terrorists, all Shias are terrorists and so on. I find this very objectionable because it feeds exactly what you said, the narrative that somehow it's target practice against Yemen because they are run by the Houthis, the Houthis are terrorists and so on. You know, Edward Said in his terrific book called Covering Islam said that one way for journalists to prevent being Orientalists, his understanding of Orientalism, meaning to treat the Orient as a place of no history, no politics and so on, he said is to emphasize the detail. The detail is a very good antidote to the flattening of a region. You know, there are politics in Palestine. There are political actors, political differences. There's a reason why the Israelis, for instance, have been putting the entire Palestinian left in prison. Why leadership of the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, Khalida Jarrar, or the People's Party of Palestine, their youth movement are targeted by the Israelis. They want to remove the left from active um, you know, Palestinian politics and then say, well, only Palestinian leadership is Hamas. Therefore, Hamas is a terrorist. Palestinians are terrorists. This is what the Israeli political scientist Baruch Kimmeling called politicide. And it's the same thing that operates regarding, for instance, Yemen. There's a politicide. There is a complete erasure of the actual details, the fabric of politics in Yemen. And so it's let's treat these parts of the world as target practice. Let's just allow the Israelis to bomb Gaza, give them a green light. Let's allow the United States and Britain to bomb Yemen because it's target practice against these parts of the world, the whole part that is terrorist. It's a very much like how the New York Times talks about the southern part of Beirut by calling it a Hezbollah stronghold. Um, therefore, you can just bomb the whole of, of the Dahiye region of, of Beirut. You can bomb all the Palestinians in Gaza. You can bomb all the Yemenis in Yemen. As we move towards the end, Vijay, I want to stick with the topic of narrative because Ignorance is sort of a necessary element for imperialism to spoon feed a false narrative. You have to not know the history of Yemen, not know the history of Iran, not know the history of Lebanon in order to allow yourself to be deceived by imperialist propaganda. And that's what it is. It's imperialist propaganda. It's designed to make people hate the Yemenis by calling them Houthis and calling them terrorists, to call the Palestinians and Hamas terrorists. Uh, you know, all of these tools, these tools re that require ignorance. If you actually knew, for instance, if the American people knew what was actually going on in Iraq between 1991 and 2003, people would not have believed and could not have believed that Iraq was a powerful military menace possessing weapons of mass destruction. You couldn't think that if you actually knew that history. So ignorance is a requirement. And one of the things that your work is so important in completing is filling out for people historical information and perspective as a counter to an enforced ignorance by an imperialist propaganda machine that relies on people not knowing. I want to go, I'm, I'm saying this to set up what's going on, the history of Gaza real quick towards the end. Gaza itself is an Israeli invention. Gaza itself, there was no Gaza Strip before 1948. Uh, 
you know, it was during the Nakba, during the expulsion of the Palestinian people by the colonial project, by the Zionist forces operating with the support of the U.S. and the U.K., driving out hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their, from their lands. And, you know, Jordan and Lebanon and Syria accepted some of the Palestinians who were being driven from their villages, and they set up refugee camps. And Egypt said no to that. Egypt did not take the people in that part of historic Palestine who were being driven out. So the Israeli establishment decided that they were going to take 2% of Palestine and create the Gaza Strip in order to drive some parts of the Palestinian population there to be occupied and surrounded in the Gaza Strip because Egypt said no, they wouldn't take the refugees. So Israel creates the Gaza Strip. Gaza City existed for a long time. It was a major city, an important city. Now, Ilan Pape, the Israeli historian, has written and recently in many interviews talked about something called Order Number 40. Order Number 40, which people can find in the Israeli archives, was an order from the Central Command of the Israeli Forces in 1948, in November 1948, instructing the regional commanders in that part of Israel, in that part of Palestine to blow up 11 villages, to blow up or burn down 11 villages. And they are the villages that are on the other side of the wall of what is now called the Gaza Strip. Those were the areas that became then the site of Israeli settlements. So when Hamas carried out the October 7th attack, they were actually going into the areas that had been burned down and blown up by order number 40 to force those last Palestinians out of that part of historic Palestine and into this newly Israeli created thing called the Gaza Strip. I'm saying this because here we are 75 years later, now 76 years later, the, young, the grandfathers, the grandmothers, the parents, now the grandchildren, they were right on the other side of the wall where the Israelis under and through order number 40 burned down their homes. Some of the homes were stoned. That's why they had to be blown up rather than burned down. And so for three generations, you could see, you could look and see this area and say, that was our homes. We, they were destroyed. They were burned down. And when the Israelis, and I mean, when the Palestinians in Gaza had the great march of return in 2018, they went to the wall and they said, we have a right to return. And they were pointing not far away. They were pointing right over the wall towards those 11 villages that were burned down by order number 40. And when they came to the great march on return, of return, peaceful, nonviolent protests, they were shot down by Israeli snipers who treated them as target practice. So then you have a few years later, in 2023, six years later, and five years later, it's not a peaceful protest, it's an armed incursion into the same area that was destroyed by order number 40. And then the American media says, ah, see, Hamas is terrorist. But if you know this history, if you're not completely ignorant of this history, then the narrative doesn't fly. And that's, I want to, I want to, as we, I'm going to give you the final word on this, because I think that us, our movement, our anti-imperialist movement, providing the information, perspective, and historical knowledge is key and crucial to winning over the people of this country. Because ultimately, if you believe as a Marxist, as I do, that people make history, they need the information, the arguments, the history, the perspective, so that they can fight and actually fight against those who are oppressing them or oppressing others in their name. Go ahead. Well, you know, so much of, of world history in the last 70 years since uh, the end of Second World War has been the struggles by people who had been colonized uh, to win some space for themselves in the world, to democratize the world system. Part of that is for people to demand their humanity, you know, demand their right to be human. Well, 
one of the ways to be human is to demand your right to history to demand your right to a place in history um you know you erase the humanity of a person by saying that your understanding of your history in fact your place in history is irrelevant uh, you are a bystander and the palestinians have fought through that entire period since the world war to end it to fight for their right to history their existence as a people even their name palestinian as a legitimate name uh, their right to land Uh, you know these things are fundamental their right to existence to be there uh, and therefore their right to be human i mean you, you can't uh, surrender or or break apart the idea of humanity from the idea of history you have to have a right to your history and the palestinians are being denied that right uh, they are being told that history starts every time they fired a gun october 7th there is no history before that um and this fight to demand a history is a fight to make the conflict come into its own meaning this is not something that the palestinians are imposing on the israelis this is something that the british imperialists and european jews who came from europe victims of the holocaust of family members victims of the holocaust they were imposed on this region by british imperialism uh, by europe unwilling to come to terms with its own role in a long history of antisemitism <coughs> the holocaust did not happen um, in the arab lands the holocaust did not happen in palestine the holocaust happened in germany in eastern europe europe has to come to terms with its own actual antisemitic history um, they should not impose the idea of antisemitism on people who are merely fighting for the right to be human um antisemitism is a european problem of course other people adopt all kinds of european problems and become antisemites but antisemitism didn't emerge first in jerusalem it didn't emerge in gaza city it didn't emerge in haifa it emerged in europe and this is a european problem the fight for a history brian is also a fight to talk with some forthrightness about what we're dealing with here this is not an israel palestine conflict this is a conflict that has been imposed upon the palestinian people the muslim palestinian people the christian palestinian people and the jewish palestinian people who predated the arrival of europeans fleeing from european antisemitism that is part of the history the narrative that we have to fight for in order to fight for the rightful humanity of all the palestinian people all of their humanity denied not only by the mass killings in gaza but the humanity even denied by the histories that are told about them vj um how can people find tricontinental institute for social research uh, how can they subscribe how can they get your works you're a prolific author of many books but tricontinental institute is providing information on an almost weekly basis or even more frequently how can they how can they find the institute well it's a very long um, url for the website but it effectively is the tricontinental.org just follow my lips the tricontinental.org go there you can subscribe read the material we're very happy for you to be part of our world thanks a lot for that brian okay and there it is people can watch it at the bottom of the screen uh, to subscribe to vj's work uh, tricontinental institute for social research vj prashad thank you so much thanks a lot brand